Hey guys, I just want to let you know, I absolutely love using Anchor. I have over 100 episodes with Anchor. And the great thing about it is I get to help a lot of different people. I've had over a thousand listeners and I've actually had people reach out to me telling me that it actually saved their life. So if you have anything that you want to talk about, if you have a passion, if you have um, a goal, definitely start podcasting using Anchor. It's probably the best thing I've done in my podcasting career. Hello. Hey, brother. How are you? Hey, man. I'm good. How are you? How do I sound? You sound good. You sound amazing. You sound awesome. All right. Great. Welcome to the show. Uh, guys, this is going to be a fun episode because we don't know where this is going to be going. We're just today. Uh, my name is Richard Kaufman. I am also known as the Comeback Coach. I want to welcome a brand new friend of mine. And uh, one thing I'm happy is he's a Lakers fan like I am. So we have a lot, a lot of different stuff in common. This gentleman's name is Pete Turner, an amazing guy. In uniform, out out of uniform, just crushing it in life. Welcome to the show, Peter. How are you, brother? Hey, man, I'm really good. I uh, I appreciate the uh, wonderful intro. And yeah, I mean, I definitely dig the Lakers. Almost got hired by them to do their podcast. I was the one of the final two guys they considered. And uh, I'm not mad with the guy they picked. They picked the right guy. And I still get to enjoy and don't got to work as hard. Cool. So yeah. how, how was your Christmas? It was good, you know, small, peaceful, and uh, fulfilling. Okay, that, that's always a good thing. And now with COVID, you know, it's great that we can appreciate what we have and, and, be, and have some gratitude in life. Yeah, yeah. I definitely focus on grace and gratitude as uh, default values. I fail at it all the time, but I'm always working on getting better. I got, I got it. So I love, I can't wait to be on your show. I think that's going to be fun. I think we're going to have a great time. Yeah, for sure. So tell us, where are you, uh, where were you born? What state? I was born in California in Oakland and uh, raised all the way until I left for the army. So you were, how, what was little Pete like as a kid? Uh, pretty much a hooligan. You know, I wasn't a bad kid, but I had a lot of energy. Uh, it was the best place for me to be was outside of the house. And so, uh, you know, I, uh, I didn't get into trouble, but I didn't not get into trouble, if that makes sense. Now, were you, were you a sports kind of kid? Yeah, for sure. I had a ball or a glove or something with me all the time. Even as like a 20-something-year-old, if there was a basketball game happening, I'd be there and playing. I mean, I played sports nonstop. So in high school, I guess you were the jock? I wouldn't say that. Um, I didn't really play on the team sports, really. Uh, I had a social life outside of that stuff, so I was more of a pickup athlete, I guess you would say. It's not that I didn't play sports. I, mean, I played some soccer, I swam, and those kinds of things. But um, I was—I I didn't really necessarily want to be in a league doing something, but I loved playing football on my own terms, loved baseball. And then my friends weren't really jock-type friends. I got along with everybody, but my friends were more um, – just a different set of people. Okay. So now – when you graduate high school, what is your next step? I went off to college. And by saying that, I mean, I, I went to a bunch of colleges, starting with, you know, community colleges and culminating with the degree finally. But I must have gone to, I don't know, 10 different schools along the way, just kind of hopping around, doing this, doing that, taking this class. Very, uh, very exploratory in my pursuit of a degree. So where did your degree actually end up? It's uh, from a school that no longer, well, it no longer has the same name. It's called Cal State East Bay, but it was called uh, Cal State Hayward, and I graduated from there in 92. So, okay. Yeah. And you decided to join the military after that? Yeah, I couldn't find a job. It was a bad time for college graduates to get hired to do anything, and I didn't go to school to, you know, I mean, God bless, everybody's got to do what they got to do, but. All the jobs at the job fairs were I'm like, yeah, but I'm a communications TV radio guy. Why am I going to go be, you know, someone who's not the manager at an enterprise rental car? Like that just wasn't my thing. And so um, I couldn't find I couldn't find work. And at some point um, I had to I had to solve that. I didn't have enough experience to get work. 
but I couldn't get work to get an experience problem. And I had never considered the military until basically the month before I signed up. So what did you decide to do in the military? What kind of job did they give you? Yeah, I tested really well. And so they're like, any job you want. And I kind of described what it was. And my recruiter was perfect. I'm like the one guy that could say he didn't lie to me at all. He was like, I was the last guy he put in the army. because he was, he was, you know, going on to his next assignment. And so he was just straight up with me. And I said, leave me alone until I make my decision. And then once I do, then we'll go, fa- we'll go fast. And he's like, okay, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's easy for me. And so he's like, hey, man, you should try this counterintelligence thing. I've not put anybody in the army on this job. And I don't know what it is. And it says intelligence, so it must be good. And uh, he was right. So where did you go to basic? Where was your basic in uh, AIT? I did basic at Leavenworth. I'm not sorry, not Leavenworth, Leonard Wood. And then I did uh, AIT at Fort Huachuca in Arizona, southern, southern Arizona. Okay. So what was that like from going from a, a guy that really wasn't a team kind of guy to joining the military where a lot of it's about team? Yeah, I had to figure it out. I had to figure it out for sure. I mean, I it was not, wasn't I wasn't a good team player, you know, but yeah, that organizational structure. I sort of was still in full rebellion mode on those kind of things. Um, so what I did, what I, you know, kind of my plan was I was already in good shape and athletic when I came in. So um, I realized that in basic, you know, and I could shoot. So in basic, all of their problems were solved. You know, I was smart enough to figure out how to, you know, spit back the answers that I had to memorize. I already could run and do push-ups all day long. You know, I was basically a max PT guy almost from the jump. And then, you know, it's made it simple. And AIT was the same kind of thing. I just, there were so many people in my AIT company. You know, our, our companies were battalion sized a lot of times. So they were enormous companies. And it wasn't hard to just do your job, stay out of the way. And then, you know, six months later, get deployed somewhere. Or I shouldn't say deployed, assigned somewhere. So obviously, uh, from what I've read on your bio, you've been many, many different places and had many different experiences. Yeah. So it's, it's something that kept you, because a lot of times, you know, we get in, in a job and eventually, no matter how cool it is, it just becomes a job. Mm. Did, this, did, did this keep you uh, mentally in the game the whole time? My first part of my, so I went to Germany and as a spy, when you, when you go to your assignment, you really don't know what you're doing. You haven't really been trained in anything. You've been kind of given like the very basics, the minimum required to get you out the door, which is not the minimum required to make you proficient at your job. So I really didn't know what I was doing. And I got to the unit and they're like, Hey, this is great. You're going to work in ops basically. So I was, you know, a support guy and uh, it was a terrible job. It was horrible. I mean, there was nothing to do every day. It was like, what, what are we going to do today? Uh, you guys are going to go clean this or you're going to go gather wood and metal around the post and take it to the recycling. You know, it's these random jobs and it was completely unsatisfying. So I, I'm like, well, I need to I need to promote myself. So I started just working feverishly at that, doing correspondence courses, all of those things that that you do, you know, with the you know soldier of the month boards and all of those things. I tried to find other ways to excel because there was just no way to do it. And right in the middle of that, as I was about to like get to like the point where I was going to get promoted, um, they deployed all of us to Bosnia and I, I finally got to do the job. And that part was awesome. So that part actually, and unfortunately in the kind of work that you do, if you screw up too bad on, on the job training, you could probably not come home if you oh, screw yeah. it too bad. So I'm it, sure you have to yeah. go through a lot of classes on psychology and relationships. You'd be surprised at the lack of, of training that goes into teaching someone how to be a spy. Like they're really, you can go to courses, but it's usually more seasoned soldiers that go and who honestly, a lot, a lot of times don't do the work because they've, they've aged out of the field work. So I, um, and you're right about the OJT and it being dangerous. There isn't a more dangerous job than collecting intel outside of the camp. I mean, there's just nothing more dangerous than that. And we were a small element. And I was writing about because I'm working on my book. 
and I was writing about it the other day and it just kept dawning on me like, holy cow, we were really alone. We were really exposed all the time. And, you know, we managed to figure out a way that I think I learned to improve to the point where I was securing myself less with force and more with force of personality. Because when you're out like that, it really is just you or a small team in my case of four people. And you're so ambushable, like you really can't rely on force at all. Okay, so now, because I'm, I'm very interested in this. Um, say if you have a subject you know you're going to have to meet. Okay. Or talk to how much studying and groundwork do you have to do in order to know what tells are in when you're talking to this individual? Yeah, it's a good question. And it's the question that we're all sort of trying to figure out. So you are self selecting books and trying to read because there are no institutional answers. You know, the, the military, you're deployed, it's time to do the job. Whatever help we could give you ahead of time is past and you know they you know the model like you know you like you spill a gallon of sweat now to save up you know whatever a gallon of, of blood and come we we trained in the most idiotic way i mean being you know pretty critical of the military here but we were no way were prepared to deploy my my team my vehicle had no radio and i was going to leave the camp daily think about that so the training literally all of it was like whatever i could figure out along the way and it was trial and error. And that's how I got to do it. And our team was fortunate in that we got to actually do the job. A lot of teams got hemmed up by the system because we're a weird element. and People don't know how to properly deploy us. And so they think they know what's best. And if the leadership is weak on the team. You, you don't do your job. So to answer your question in a long fashion, um, I had to figure out how to be security prepared understand what the command needed from me in terms of information. I had to work on those things on the camp. Everything else was up to me off the cuff as I talked to that person, trying to figure out what was what. And then the hardest part about all of this is you can't go for what you obviously want. You can't take a direct path because it doesn't reliably work. So you have to learn how to have a very relaxed, long form conversation that gets you to where you want to be. So where you're lightly in control, but the subject never knows it. Okay. So I guess it's kind of like you have to really build r trust. And like you said in your bio, you know, if you're going to, you have to build some kind of trust in a relationship, but you also, you know, cause I'm a big poker guy. Yeah. You can't show your own tells. So you actually have to really work on yourself a lot mm -hmm. yeah that you found that you had to really do yeah absolutely i mean you're you're getting down the very essence of what you have to figure out it's easy to say hard to do right so people always say establish you know trust and build rapport but how do you do that how do you know when you've got it um i play poker a little bit too and my main thing is is if i don't know who the players are i don't play many hands you know, sure, if something drops in my lap, I play it, but that's going to be a strong hand. So for, so to beat somebody with a weaker hand, I, I just watch and I try to see what I can pick up and then I test those things. And so it's the same thing when you're out in the field collecting is, is you don't just go for the pie. You don't try to win the night on the first hand, you know, like it's, I, there's no better way to say it. You're like, yeah, that pot, I'm going to let that go because I want to see how this goes down next time and see if there's a pattern here. So. It's absolutely like poker for sure. But you also can't overplay. Like if you try to play like you're the champ, you're being played by everybody else. Yeah, I, I totally get that. Okay. Now, what, now, unfortunately, when you're in your kind of work, you don't trust anybody because you're, that's the way you're taught. So what was it like trying to have an, a, a life outside of work when you're not in Bosnia or, Afghanistan or Iraq what is that what is that like to have to when you're meeting somebody and unfortunately you're trying to read them and you're trying it becomes a mental thing that that's you something you do to everybody so what's that like yeah you have to mature out of that I mean some guys don't some guys live in that world and they're always suspicious and looking for the person around the corner or the person conducting surveillance on it they're always doing that whether it's real or not and then so you can convince yourself it's easy. This is easy to do, man. You can convince yourself you're being followed 
if that's all you look for. So uh, I did my best to not do that. But I have to be honest, early on, like I would try to control every conversation that I was in. And maybe the person didn't know I was doing it. Maybe they did. I'm a pretty likable guy, ultimately, right? So I can get away with it. But I knew I was doing it. I would recognize it later. And so I had to get better at recognizing it. So I didn't do that to my friends. Now, sometimes for like party fun, I, I would say like, this is what I can do. And I'll do it to you over the course of the night. And then they'd be like, there's no way you can do that. And I'm like, <laughs> all right, here's what's going to happen. And I would tell my friend, here's exactly what's going to happen. You're, I'm going to point at you. He's going to be mad. And I'm going to make all this stuff. Happen. And I would orchestrate these things. So I had to learn that while that's a fun party trick, it's not cool for me to do that as a person to anybody if I'm not like in this environment where I have to, I have to control these conversations. And, and also I got better at not needing as much control of the conversation because I don't always know where we need to go. That person may want to take me down a different conversational path that I never would have considered if I allow them to. So as I got better, I required less control. I tried to control conversations with my friends less, and I tried to be a whole lot less suspicious of, of the people and the threats around me. And ultimately, when I finally stopped doing it, it was primarily because I was tired of living in a world of threat-focused thinking. I, I was good at not doing it, but the people around me was just everything was a threat all the time, and I just didn't want to live that way. I was tired of it. You know, like you said, I don't know where our conversation is going to go. It's like two brothers having coffee yeah. somewhere. Uh, now, being having your own show, of course, sometimes you have to lead the guest where you want them to go. Um, so I'm sure that actually helped a lot from your training when you're talking to different people. You know, you'll be able to lead to a certain conversation, but then sometimes it, it becomes more than you ever thought it would become. Because then they open up to you, yeah. and it because like me, they call me the ma the veteran Oprah, because I like to get you know go deep and I like then people end up talking, tell me about everything they didn't mean to talk about. Yeah, that day, you know, just because you're being open and you know you're you're actually listening to the person, because I'm sure you can speak on. There's a difference between listening and hearing. Yeah, and I would even go further than that. And, and you're right, like I've I've been following your show a lot more lately because I, I think like it's you me jocko like we're at the top of this mountain for veteran podcasts you know there's just very few people that have the ability the pedigree and all these things so yeah i mean anybody's listening i mean your show is fantastic you get you do a great job of, of diving into these things um the conversations that i have I, again, I try not to control it. I have an idea of where I'm going and, and I have a basic format, right? Like before, during, after, something like that. But those are the, the three segments I might try to do if I feel like a segment is needed. But I also have no problem throwing that framework away and letting the show run where it needs to run. Because what I do, and this is where I'm, the listening thing where I'm going to add an element, I don't listen to people when I'm doing my show. I listen for things. And when I hear the thing that I need, and this is the same thing I would do in the field when I was collecting. When I hear the topic, when the bell rings, ding, ding, and I'm like, oh, right here. Well, let's dive in here. So then I dive down with an exploring question, like, tell me more about this. And then they tell me more. What's your opinion about this? And then I explore, like, that cave that I've dug out because that's where the gold is. I, I don't need to go across this linear timeline. I need them to really dig into the deep part of their brain and access those memories and those emotions and then draw that out. So I'm listening for those moments rather than, and not that I don't listen to the person, but I'm listening for those cues to say, this is where we need to go. And then bam, we go down that hole. And like you said, you, you get the Oprah moments where the person's like, gosh, I, I've never said this out loud before, but, and then they say it, you know? So, yeah. and it's, it's not from a purpose of control. It's from a point of, this is what's interesting to me. And that person wants to oblige that interest. Mm -hmm. Now, because you said, you know, you're in all these other countries. And you're meeting with, like, say, if you're in Bosnia, you have to learn the the traditions. You have to learn the, the way to talk to people. Certain things if, that we do in America, if we try to do them in another country. It's disrespectful. So I'm sure you had to learn all these things. Was this all from, from reading or did they have classes? Way to do these things. And I'm glad you asked this question because there's – and you guys wouldn't know this without having to do it. But when you go to another place – you don't try to out uh, a Bosniak. You don't try to out Iraq and Iraqi. 
You, you just don't try to do it. So it's better, even if you have that knowledge, and I would tell my interpreter this all the time, I'm going to ask questions that you know I know the answer to. I'm asking this question for a reason, so go ahead and ask it. And so like I would, like Ramadan would come up and I would see an opportunity to create some trust and some rapport. And so I would ask an obvious question or make an obvious mistake about rapport or about uh, Ramadan, for example. And my interpreter would look at me and be like, you know this. And I'm like, I also told you, like, there's a reason why I'm asking the question. Like the spell would be so strong, it would even work on my interpreter. So that cultural bit by simply asking, you know, hey, Kaufman, how do you, how do you figure out this? Like if I was going to ask you, like, how do you cope day to day with being blind? You know, you would you know, like explain these things to me and you would be compelled to explain your day to day life because it's such a part of who you are. I would rather learn culture from you because it's your distinct culture than to read it in a book. So I typically don't read any books on that stuff because the the knowledge and the seasoning that I get from being in the field is so much richer. And I don't worry about offending somebody via culture because I'm an expert at it now. So if I do something and it's wrong, you know, I'll have a me mechanism for dealing with it with that person directly. And they say, hey, you shouldn't do that. I, okay, great. Explain it to me. Now they're, again, opening their heart and their culture to me. And I'm in receive mode and it's so much stronger. So you're allowed to make cultural mistakes. It's just you have to go to that person and dig into their cultural knowledge and let them be an expert so that you can learn at their level and build trust simultaneously. I love that. And it's true. Now, something that uh, I noticed that you do, um, Jocko does, a lot of people do that are successful when they're talking to somebody, they use the other person's name. Because what is the one thing that we love to hear? Our name. Yeah. You know, you know, we all listen to that same radio station. You know, the what is it? What are we listening for? We love to hear our name. So tell us about how that helps when you're out in the field talking to somebody to get to gain more of their interest. Yeah, it's interesting. It kind of depends on the person. Right. So because what I do is so dangerous for me and for that person, I typically leave names out of it. But I use another tool in its place because I just don't want to identify anybody unnecessarily because I don't know what will happen five minutes after I leave. And I don't want to put that person in a harmful situation. So I'm very open with what I'm doing. Very obvious. But what I do do is I'll say things like, let's say that, um, you know, we're in Burbank, California, and that's where I'm talking to this person. They're from Burbank. And I'll say things like, and Burbank's wonderful. You guys are the most host like being at your house eating this food it's fan and i don't lie about this like i'm a genuine like let someone know that they're a good host let someone know that you would you really appreciate their home it's really fantastic you know i've been to a lot of iraqi homes yours is wonderful and now they're instantly get that's the same thing as their name right and so they're gonna be like yes yes we've worked hard in our home and now they're gonna brag about their home to me and i'm gonna know more about them as a person i actually care about this we don't have to just talk about war and death all the time. He could talk about his, his family as, as appropriate as I would never ask about their wife, but I can ask about their homestead and their position in the community. And they'll give all that information to me easily. They want to, they're, they're desperate to. Now, this is like, and the reason why I'm asking a lot of these questions, because the people that are listening to this, they're either veterans or they're entrepreneurs or they're both. So I want them to, to learn about, how to talk to people how to sometimes you got to dig deep like when i interview somebody i actually usually go really deep like i went so deep uh on an interview this week that i actually talked to this guy's college roommate <laughs> and i told him that on the show he's like he did what <laughs> like yeah because i i want to make sure that if i ask you a question i know what i'm talking about like if me and you were talking and we're talking about the lakers if i'm not a real lakers fan and you start asking me questions about, oh, you, you remember, you remember when, you know, blah, blah, blah. Remember when Odom was still playing and, and I'd be like, uh, no, I don't remember that. Then you're going to get caught up in a lie. You know what I mean? Just because you tried to be, get close to somebody and it wasn't right. real. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I see a lot of that on like social media. That there's no transparency a lot of times. Yeah. I, I totally agree with what you're saying. And as someone, as a spy who would go out in the field, I focused on being honest with my feelings, with my story. You know, you don't got to tell them everything, but 
I didn't want, ever want to be in a position where I met two people who I'd encountered from different places at the same time and have them have different stories of who I am and what I did. And that if I'm doing my job, I'm going to meet these people in the same environment from separate paths. If I'm doing my job well, right? Because I've got to know, I've got to know everybody. I've got to connect to all the networks and you can't do that. Well, I don't know how to do that. Well, starting with the false premise. And so I was always going to be authentic. I was always going to be truthful. I was always going to, you know, shut up more than I ran my mouth because, you know, if I'm talking, how in the world am I collecting? So that's what I tried to balance. It took me forever to learn this though. I mean, <laughs> I mean forever, Richard, I made all the mistakes. I, I over talked, I let my ego out of the cage, all those things. And when I learned to slow down, be deliberate, treat this like this was dangerous and delicate, I got a lot better and a lot better real fast. So, so much so that my peers could come up to me and talk about things and I could hear how they were missing things and why they were struggling. And if they were willing to, I could tweak that a little bit and say, you need less of this, more of that. And that's sort of how I approach my show too. Less of this, more of that. Like people say, how do I get better at podcasting? And I'll just say, slow down. Figure out what that means for you, but slow down. You're missing things. You're rushing too much. You're too excited. Slow down. And it's invariably, it improves their game when you hear them slow down. I love that. So how many years did you actually serve in the our country? Well, I was in the military for a little over five years. I did five years of active time and then a couple of years of reserve time. But I was with the military for another, you know, 10 years almost. So I, I was better at being with the military than in it. Again, because, you know, okay. I, I, you know, just because of how I was and how I was, I was, a, I was a wild animal as a kid and I wasn't a whole lot different as a, as a, as a professional in the army. You know, I mean, I often was self-supervised, you know, I mean, I would go out on patrols, I would attach myself to a patrol, but they, for the most part, left me alone. I was just like this wild horse. And so I'd go up to brigade and they'd be like, who the hell is this guy? Why, you know, it's like, why does he know these things? It, and I had to learn how to manage my wild nature, but yeah, I was definitely better at being with the military than, than in it. Okay. This is going to be a great segue. Um, I want to thank our sponsors. They're all military all the time. Um, my, my first sponsor, Maxwell soaps. They actually make some of the best soaps that you'll ever use with no bleach whatsoever. So it's good for your skin. But every time you buy a bar of soap, they actually give a, so a bar of soap away to somebody in the California, um, the homeless areas, so they can keep clean. So they, they, they're called Maxwell Soaps. Second guy you probably heard of, his name is Ryan Hemhauser. He is the owner of um, Disgruntled Veterans. And he has five or six different groups of the disgruntled veterans. Up to 1.2 million veterans are a part of his group. So that's disgruntled veterans. And like I said, I'm just really grateful. And then one of my friends, he's not a military guy. He's a 16-year-old kid that does a lot of stuff. And he's very proud of helping veterans and first responders. So he has a, a company called Do Work That Matters, and his name is Miller Browning, and I wanted to give him a shout out. So those are my sponsors for today. Thank you, guys. Without you, there would be no comeback, Coach. There would be no uh, show. So now, what kind of jobs, I mean, obviously, people would think, okay, CIA, blah, blah, blah. But how was it when you get out of the military? You know, what do you put on your resume, spy? You know what I mean? <laughs> what was it like? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the hard part is – People, even in the military, they don't know what I do, right? And so when I would show up and talk about it, they would always say the same thing. Or do you have to kill me if you talk about it? And I'm like, no, I can, I can just talk about it. It's all right, you know? But they didn't know what to make of me. And, I, and to this day, they still don't know what to make of folks like me. I'm a very unique spy in the spy world in that, you know, as, as I stayed in longer, I got better because I got to stay on the ground. And I learned how to communicate vertically within the military at a high level so that I could speak commander in a way that made sense to generals all the way down to, to lieutenants, right? I, I could communicate in a way that made sense because I spoke to their commander sensibility. But I didn't, 
if you stay in, you end up promoting and you get away from the field. You start running teams and you start running teams, of team, you know, all these things. Right. And so I was able to stay on the ground. So when I would go out and try to apply and that kind of thing, the CA wanted nothing to do with me. Um, and I really didn't really want to do what they did. You know, like it just, we were never a good fit. We tried, we didn't we decided not to date, but in, in general, most, because I was on the side of a mountain, most of my career out forward projected in the field, talking to, the people, my network were all warlords and criminals and murderers. <laughs> so when I came back, I didn't know anybody. I hadn't spent time next to the, the colonel that became a general. I didn't know those people. I just, and when I briefed him, it was temporarily. So like um, the guy that's about to become sec def general Austin, you know, he, I've briefed that dude. I believe he even knew my name at one point, but he doesn't know me from Adam because I was just this gray man that would show up have important things to say, shut up, go away and go back to work. And so uh, I, I, I didn't have any opportunity to really effectively work. I applied, Richard, I applied for over a thousand jobs when I got done working with the military and I didn't even get interviews. The only interviews I ever got were favors to friends. And two of those interviews, two of those three interviews, one time the person said, go back to Afghanistan. The other person said, I can't afford you before we ever talked about what I might charge him to work with him. And then the other person said, I recognize the word counterintelligence because my brother did that in the Marines. And so I thought I'd give you this job. And it, it was a temp job. And so I never got all these companies that I applied to that I, I was absolutely qualified to do things for. None of them even bothered to bring me in to talk to me. So, okay, so I yeah. got a question for you to ask. I got to ask because where I'm sitting right now, I'm actually looking out over where the World Trade Centers once stood. And um, it's a, it means a lot to me. It's a very important thing, not in 11. But do you think now after 9-11 that all the alphabet companies, do you think they actually talk a little bit more? They communicate a little bit better after 9-11? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I'm not part of their community, honestly. You know, I, I just I've never I've never been part of what they want because I work out in the field so i really can't relate to how they communicate i don't i'm not able to okay. communicate with them okay like i said yeah. i wanted to sometimes you got to answer yeah no questions. it's a good question and it, i should have a better answer but we've never figured out how to get along i can i can try but if they don't let me talk to them then i can't tell you how to talk to them so then what did you do what was your you have to eat somehow <laughs> yeah you know you have, you have to pay yeah. the bills I, I, you have a beautiful you have a beautiful son so obviously you, you got to yeah. feed him. So what did you do for work when you got out? When, you know, as soon as you got I out. I have a daughter, by the way, not a son. <laughs> got to correct you on that one. It's, and which is fine. No, I'm you're totally fine. It. She just graduated college. I'm super proud of her. Her name's Brenna. And she's, uh, she's the light of my life. I do have to eat. And because no one would hire me or even talk to me about hiring me, I had to become a handyman. And I was not a handyman. I mean, I was not handy at all. I had to learn how to do it. And what made me great at it, and I was the best handyman in the, in the San Francisco Bay Area, I was the number one guy for this app that did chores for people, basically, um, was that I was great at managing the customers. You know, like I can carry a couch all day. I'm a big, strong guy. But what mattered most was I would meet that that stay-at-home mom who's like, I just am trying to figure out what to do with this garbage disposal. And I would say, I want you to worry about something else besides this because this is done. And that's what made me good. It wasn't, you know, I just did it to survive and I was great, great at it. And I made a little bit of money. But the, the truth is, is that I had to figure out all of it all over again, because ultimately nobody wanted me. Nobody, nobody yes, wanted I was me to ask yeah. you, you know, because, you know, it's kind of like, you know, when I got out of the military, you know, every, you know, everybody knows if somebody's been in battle, if they've been a, a part of tanks or whatever, there's that rush. There's that you become an adrenaline junkie, and I'm sure that you've had a lot of uh, uh, adrenaline moments in the military. Now you're talking to housewives about about their garbage disposals. What did you do to get your jollies? I should say, for a better word, what was your how, what was your outlet to have some fun in in life at that point? Yeah, it's a good question because. Uh... You know, I'm in some ways, I'm still trying to figure that out. I mean, when you talk about the experiences that I've had, and you mentioned a tank, I've been hit by a tank. The vehicle I was in and the vehicle behind me, we were both hit by a tank. 
on an American camp by Americans. And so like, these are like near death experiences. And so at some point, you know, you, you need something to, to do with that. And, you know, I, I did things like uh, my, my friends and I have a race car that we race. That's a lot of fun. And I really enjoy that. But I wouldn't say I was as much of an adrenaline junkie as I was more of a, an influence junkie. I was super influential with the commands that I worked with because I was excellent at what I did. And I could predict it. I could tell them like a poker player, like I'm going to come in and take all your money in 20 minutes. You're going to realize it. You're not going to believe it. So you're going to keep me around for two hours. and I'm going to continue to take your money over the next two hours. I would do that basically to the commander and say, you don't get me. You don't know me. You don't know how to use me. But in three months, you're going to look at me and say, you're my best asset. You don't have to say it because we've already had the conversation now. And I would, and then and you'll give me open access to come into your office whenever I want, sit on your couch, and we'll try to figure some things out. And they would all take me on that bet because, you know, what do they have to lose? And then every time in three months, I'd look at them, they'd look at me, and they'd be like, ah, have a seat on the couch whenever you want. You know, they knew. So I say that not to brag, but just to, to reveal, like, that was my level of influence. I could take a unit that came in and didn't know what to do. And because I'd been in that area a long time, or even if I was brand new, I knew how to do what they needed to do more than they did as an organization. I knew where their flaws were as an organization. And I spent most of my time studying us and limiting the damage that we were doing to our own mission more than I really ever focused on threat. Because a lot of times the threat part was such a minor and infrequent part of what we did when we deployed that to focus 100% of your collection effort on it would be to waste most of your capacity. So I, of course, found threat-based things, but we were the bigger problem most of the time. And so that influence is what I fell out from underneath me. Nobody cared about me anymore. I was obsolete and irrelevant and ignored. And those things damn near killed me when I realized that was, that was how I felt. All right, then let me ask you a question because um, in business, you know, even if you're a podcast, whatever business you're in, you're an influencer. No matter which way you look at it, you are. And you can either use it. It sounds corny. But you can either use it for good or you can use it for bad, you know, especially in business, because as you and I both know, we can go somewhere. And if you're a good talker and a great listener, you can pretty much get whatever you want. And how did you not decide, you know, I'm going to go in business and I know so much mentally that I can take over any over any conversation. And if I wanted to any business. Yeah. I, uh, you know, there are certain things that I'm great at doing and um, wanting to like dominate a business where I just, I don't have the passion to do that well. And so I never really focused on that. I I tried desperately to go in through the resume hole to get a job, but I couldn't find one, made me suicidal. And then I had to deal with all of those issues and continue to deal with those issues. I realized my PTSD when I came home, not, not from incidents over there. It was a long, slow drip process because I was out every day and in danger, but that became my norm. So once I realized I had all this internal damage that I had to deal with, you know, that kind of became my focus while I did the podcast. And so my capacity to work in a way that would make sense to anybody else who would maybe want to hire me, I didn't know how to bridge that gap. And so the podcast became what I did professionally. And it's, so that's what I do now is I focus on that because it affords me the freedom to, like you said, create the influence that satisfies that part of my life that I need. But it also allows me to do something and get paid for it that other people aren't able to do. They're like, like Richard, I would go out and I would outperform the rest of the team combined in terms of finding intel, finding sources, writing reports. And I'm talking like sometimes these are big teams. And I would just every day have something new to put in there and amass this large body of knowledge. That's pretty much what I do with the podcast. That's why you know, it's, it's guys like us at the very top. I just outwork 99% of the other people out there in the veteran podcast space. I just do more. And so that's sort of my answer to that is, is I got to something that I could control, that I could outwork the problems in, and I continue to try to figure it out. And I'm not saying I'm the best. I'm not saying that I figured it all out. But by just simple repetition and, you know, my skills as a spy, I've been able to build a show that's really far up podcast mountain 
All right, so now let's talk about it because now we're like you said, we're gonna talk about business, we're yeah. gonna talk about podcasts. What are some you know, because everybody knows everybody yeah, yes. has a podcast. There's millions of them out there, but most people don't realize that the average podcast lasts six episodes and it's a wrap and it's over. People get tired, they get they quit because oh I'm, I thought I would get a million listeners. It's like, no, mm -hmm. you gotta build up. Um so what are some of the things you wish you would have known when you first started i wish i would have now. started uh at youtube first because that's for me the fastest most realistic uh opportunity to monetize you know doing that really well building it right the first time doing that before you do anything else that would be my advice to me slow down stop learn everything about youtube before you go forward spend two months doing that um that i think would be the thing that I would tell myself the most. And the rest of it would just, I could just tweak what I already knew how to do just to be more refined or more efficient. But that's the main thing is that money that, because we thought we were going to build people on our, our website, get them to go to, to Amazon links, click on that. And we would drive revenue that way. That's what we thought. And then we thought after that, we'll get commercials. But none of that ever really proved to be reliable or big enough to do anything about. And so... So I would say, yeah, YouTube would be would be the thing. I'm still trying to fix YouTube, still trying to master it, still trying to get good at, at that. And if I would have started that seven years ago, you know, I'd be much further down the road. OK, so now a question is because I have a, a guy right now, not right before we got on the, um, the podcast. He's like, oh, man, I got a, I got a great show, but I can't find sponsors. He's like, I don't know how to do it. What do I do? So what, what would you say to a person like that? Because I have my own opinion. But what would you say to a person that's saying, I got a pot, I got, well, he actually has a radio show that I was on. And he has like over 700,000 listeners, but he can't find any sponsors and he doesn't know how to approach them. So how would you go about, well, if you were talking to him, if you say his name uh, yeah, it's, it's hard. I mean, it's the question we all try to answer. How do you monetize, you know, and, and what I always start with, whether it's Joe or somebody else is you have to understand what's valuable and see what's valuable in your show and how you exchange value with people. And that will give you an idea of different kinds of monetization or, you know, valuation that you can create. So if you just look at the money and the advertising part, I would say, look at the marketplace, you know, advertising has really changed and it's a lot smaller per ad and people want to go on to shows like, like that person's show. But if you're going to host this thing and that's going to be your job and you're going to put this thing out, you probably should get someone and partner with them and have them chase the ads that make sense, you know, help you figure that out, spend some money on marketing or a person who does marketing, because at some point your job is to run that show you not, not to, you can't effectively, some people can't, but you can't reliably assume that you're going to be able to outsell, outproduce shows, outmarket, out PR other people if you're doing it all yourself. At some point, you have to get some help. You have to collect heads for the hats that you have. And if you don't do that, then your show is not growing in a way that I understand. Like you could spend a lot of time getting strong enough to add heads, but that process, if you don't think about it in that way, how do I? You know, who, what's the next head I need to bring in here? I need to have a marketing person or I need to have a marketing and PR person. I can't afford a big budget. What can you afford? What can you get that? I mean, you can get a lot of help, but you have to prioritize that help. So if you've got a show with 700,000 people and you can't find money, I would say you probably should hire someone and split the profit with them because there's someone out there who specializes in that and can walk in. You got 700,000 listeners. They can walk out the door with a check from a lot of people because they want access to that. Okay. Um, like I said, we're going to continue on with the podcast, I think, because that's, you know, that's what we're talking about now. Um, so now if you get a pod, you know, when obviously when we all start our podcasts, like I might have you on the show and all of a sudden, bam, it's like 10,000 listeners. And because I knew it was going to be a great show. But then you think, you know, like you, there's going to be somebody that you thought you was had a great interview and you get like <laughs> yeah, seven right. listeners. You're like, wait a minute. I asked the same kind of questions. What, you know, how do you keep, you know, the highs, the lows? 
How do you keep on a happy medium? I don't control what the audience does. I learned this quite a while ago. It just does what it does. And so when I go in and I look at the shows and try to determine a pattern, I'm missing so much of the information that I could never know. So I'm going to give you an example. We had a show with someone who plays in a a very, very famous band. And this person, just he's not even officially part of the band. He tours with them, right? And so when they go on the road, he goes out. And this is a, a band everybody's heard of. And this show had so much traction. Okay, granted, he's a Bay Area guy. Okay, great. A lot of Bay Area people love him. They love this band. But why is it continuing day after day to get so many hits? Why, are, you know, what is going on? And I found out, I don't know, years later, this year I found out, as a matter of fact, this, there was a, a fan of that band who's like, I love this interview. I've probably listened to it 500 times. I would never know that. And so there's this huge bump of people of, of people listening to the show from my perspective, like, look at all these people. But really, there was one person driving this thing daily, constantly listening to this episode. And if I built my entire marketing model on that, I mean, how screwed up would I be? Because there's a person who just loves this episode. How do I get them to love another episode? Have that person on again, have someone else in that band on again, you know, these kind of things. I found someone who is a super fan of something that I have access to, but not a super fan of mine. So she loves my stuff. She's listened to other shows, but that person, the data that I got until she answered that question, like who the heck and how the heck is this going on? I never would have known that. And so I can't worry about what the audience does. I have to just make things that work and see if I can outwork these problems by getting better, by finding higher quality guests guests that will share the show i mean oh my god right like if someone will share the episode that you're on you know like that is so much more powerful than anything i can do by myself i can't lift this myself i need other people to share rate review you know those kind of things and if i can't if i can't build that motion if i can't build that response then that's where my work is how do you create that that path so that you have a famous person on you say hey uh let me know what your marketing person's name is. I'll shoot this over to them so they can share it out on your social media. I've never had a famous person say no to that, but I had to learn to say that first. I love that, you know, but now also as I had, there's a, there's a group that I'm involved in. I'm not going to name what it is, but the owner of the group, I said, why don't you come on the podcast? And they're like, no, wait till you get a little bit bigger. So, the next week, I'm talking to a friend of mine, and I was like, yeah, I just talked to General Petraeus. And somehow, it got back to this guy. He's like, hey, uh, you still want me to be on your show? And I'm like, wait, just because I have Petraeus right. on your show, now I'm big enough. Yep. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So when you, when, you know, because when we're all starting, as we know, this show is not a big show. I mean, it's not, you know, I'm not killing it and and i don't care if i do or not but what do you say when somebody when you were first starting when somebody say well do a couple more episodes or you know get a few more i never had that problem. come on uh partly because of how we approached it so we had very famous people on right from day one because we happened to our network know people who were very notable and we were ahead of the game on the podcast side so people weren't asking people to do podcasts all the time like they are now. It's, the, the pond is much more full of uh, fishermen now, right? I mean, there's still a lot of fish, but there's a whole lot more f- fishermen out there. So I learned early on uh, how to ask people to be on the show. I got very good at that. And then over time, the show built what I call its own bona fides, right? It's, so I can, I can pitch the show without talking about me at all anymore now. And I've been able to do this for a long time. Just because the show is so far up Podcast Mountain, I can say, here's what we've had on, you know, General Petraeus. But I don't ever say their names. I just talk about their pedigree, you know, like. Yeah. And so, yeah, when a person sees that, they go, well, yeah, (laughs) of course I want to be on this show. That sounds like you've got a fantastic show. Let's go. And so I was able to do that pretty early on because we had very notable people on the show. And I also was really good at asking. And here's the biggest thing because of my spy background. I don't say no for people. I let them tell me no. Like, what's the, if I ask someone who's super famous to come on the show and they don't respond, I am in the same position that I was in before. Like, they don't know me. They don't have to respond to me. They didn't. No harm for me, but I'm going to ask. And sometimes, though, I can't, 
I, Richard, I can't say how many times someone has said, funny, you should ask. I'm just starting to do media and I've been thinking about what podcasts I might go on. I don't know any podcasters. I'll do your show. I mean, that that has happened a lot where people just by simply asking the person, it's like the really pretty chick in the bar who never gets asked out. I'll go ask her out. Yeah, I get it. Now, uh, two questions I want, you know, or two points. By the way, I'm oh, really thanks, enjoying this conversation. Uh, and, and I'm very grateful for your friendship, most of all. You know, I put friendships above everything else. I put, you know, friendships first, family, family, friendships, business. That's the way I, I work it. But for some reason, a lot of podcasters are afraid to have other podcasters on the show like they're going to steal them or something. I'm like, I don't get it. I don't understand. You know, it's like... I, we we're all in this. We're all like you said, the big pond. So why do I have to be afraid to have you come on the show? Yeah, you know I mean, what I'm we're saying. Not competing, right? We'll have different audiences. Maybe our oh. audiences cross over. Maybe I lose some. Maybe you gain some. But who's got time to account for that? I'm not worried about that. I'm just going to continue to go fulfill my life with these great conversations. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm your friend. We're friends. I can't wait to do the next thing with you. The other thing is, is if you're going to have an impact on a show. You need to be on it more than once. Okay, yeah, some people are going to be like, oh, there's this guy, Pete, maybe he's a spy. To be you know, known to your audience, I've got to be on five, six times. they got to get to know me a little bit. It doesn't take one meeting via audio to solve that problem. So, yeah, we should be on each other's shows. We should be supporting one another because you know I'm going to share your show. I've already posted to Facebook that I'm on right now. You know, like I want to support what you're doing because if you do well, I do well. And so that's sort of my, I don't worry about my, like you, my show is not the biggest show in the world. Very, very successful. You know, I make a little bit of money from it. All of these things that people want to get to, I've done. I'm not worried about, you know, episode 20. (laughs) I'm building up to episode 1000 is about to happen for me, right? I'm well into the 900s. So it's known that I know how to do this. And yet, the other day I'm on a thread on Facebook and they're like, how do you get ranked as a top military podcast? Like you've done. I, I, I was seeing that. And it was funny because people, right. my name just started popping up. I'm like, yeah. wow, who are these people? Yeah, what? And it's great. And, and, and I'm like, Oh yeah, that's right. I've talked to this dude before we, I got to follow up. Cause you know, you, you start a conversation. It doesn't always happen, but I'm talking to these folks. They have no idea who I am and I'm not trying to come in with ego. So I'm like, Hey, listen, you know, as someone that's done this for a long time, you know, worry less about ranking, worry more about building an audience. You know, like if you want to do PR things, then focus on PR, but don't focus on PR too much because then your show will, will suffer. Like your show needs your attention. It needs your money. It needs your time to grow. It's like a plant. <clears throat> and so I was sort of explaining these things. And these people literally have no idea who I am because they're not part of my show world, you know, which is totally fine. But it's funny how, I don't know, it's just funny how these things happen where someone who has a lot of knowledge can walk in and because it's on Facebook, you know, it can be like, it can be looked at as being like, well, what do you know? Like, well, here's what I know. <laughs> I mean, I know, I know, here's what I know. I know this stuff. I've been doing it for a long time. And it's not about bragging. It's not about ego. It's just, you know, this help is here. So for folks that want to do this, don't worry about the things that you think you need to worry about. Figure out what you need to worry about. Figure out where the work is because it's probably not in getting ranked. I mean, if you've got 13 episodes, you are just getting started. You, you don't deserve to be ranked yet because no matter how great your start is, you may disappear in five episodes, you know? Yeah. Now, I got, I got a question because this is, a, it, it was kind of, I just came to my head. You know, I love <laughs> AD, having ADD because my mind yeah. goes everywhere. But, in your past life, you tried to be, do everything on the down low. And now in your new life, you're trying, you're right. branding yourself. So that had to be a, a big mind shift to where, okay, you know, at one second, you're a spy trying to be on the DL and now you're building your own brand. And most people don't realize that no matter what you do, yeah, you are your brand. Just like if, if Michael Jordan walked out tomorrow wearing Adidas. You're going to be yeah. like, what? You're your Air Jordan. So what? how do you build your brand? Well, I had to come to terms with who I am and what I am, you know. And so as a spy, you're trained to not talk about these things, not talk about, discuss that. Don't say that word. But I realized that it is a powerful thing. If people are interested in it, 
And so I did have to be like, I've got to be more open about this because it's interesting. People are going to have questions and I need to, I need to be available to those questions because it's an advantage I have over almost everybody else I meet. There's very few people that have done what I've done. And that's, you know, that I think is, is a big difference in terms of mindset is like understanding what tools you have in the bag and then putting those tools to work instead of inventing new tools. I love that. So now how do we go about, because I'm all about supporting others. You know, my show is never about me. It's always about helping others. So how do we go about finding you, supporting you and helping with all your causes? How do we find Yeah, glad you asked about causes. Let me lead with that. Uh, so I have a charity called Save the Brave that I am basically the media arm of. And what we do is we help veterans with PTSD, primarily through fishing, but lots of fellowship, lots of activity. And so, you know, just because I, I you know, every day, I have suicidal ideation. And I say that because I want the next person in line to go, wow, Pete can say that out loud. And yeah, I battle it every day. I'm okay because I've learned, to, and you know, you've had a lot of, I've listened to your stuff. You've had, you know, 10 plus years of therapy. I've had a lot of therapy too, to get to the point where I can say every, it's like being an alcoholic every day. I want to drink every day. I want to kill myself, but I also know how to work through that problem. So that's the most important thing for me to say is if you are in any kind of harm or you fear for somebody get them in contact with someone have them get a hold of me pete at break it down show.com i'm glad to do what i know how to do to help that person get on the right path and that's what we do at save the brave so that's the first thing i want to promote because it's the most important thing because if i'm of service to others the the good fortune and the and the opportunities will follow that so save the brave save the brave.org if you want to support the show, wherever you listen to podcasts, my YouTube channel is where I'd push you. You can go to just type in Pete A. Turner and break it down show and it should come up. But if you go to break it down show.com, you can also find it there. You can find me on iTunes anywhere. Uh, we're all over the place. So five shows a week, I do five lives. And then I put out five podcasts from those lives basically once a week. And usually I do about six or seven shows. So we get a lot of incredible people on. And if you're interested, but I guess you could say it's kind of like Joe Rogan. He is a fighter, you know, comedian. I am a spy. We have varied interests. We often have the same guests on our show. So very similar to that style, about an hour long conversation. And today I'm going to talk to uh, the next thing I'm going to do right now, after we're done with this, I'm going to talk to a, a former cop who she started in Oakland ended up in Vancouver, got hurt. But um, what's it like to be a cop? And then the person who's joining me, I often rotate my co-hosts. The person who's joining me is a guy who was a L.A. County sheriff guy for 40 plus years. And he's a brilliant, brilliant cop. And we're continuing to try to sort out this problem of how do we make policing make sense to us? You know, how do how do we understand that cops are desperate to be better and and more reliable parts of their community, you know, while we have all this acrimony towards police. So we're always trying to sort these things out. It's sort of like an Intel report. And that's, that's what the break it down show is. I go out, I find out things at the ground truth level, the level where I worked at in combat. And I bring these incredible guests. Sometimes they're super famous. The, the guest I had on last right, right uh, before Christmas was a guy named Dave rates, a friend of mine. And he manages a uh, 40,000 acre acre a hunk of land in orange county for wild space and it's just fascinating to hear him talk about it you've never heard of him maybe when you walk on the trail next time yeah. his show will give you some idea of what happens to make that trail happen all of the work and the things that go into it so it's stuff like that man the break it down show it's cool it's it's the the best work of my life i'm super proud of it and if anybody wants to check it out just break it down show.com and work your way out from there cool and by the way I'm going to throw a little bit at you. I'm going to actually have you name this episode for when it goes out. You're going to nice. name this episode. Okay. All so, right. so you can just send it whenever. Um, I, I appreciate you coming on, my brother. Um, now we talked, I consider you a friend, a family member. And if there's anything I can ever do to help you, um, please let me know. This is going to go out probably the f second week of January. It's going to go out all my platforms on my website.